John was on a roll. For quite some time he had been preaching a fiery message to all kinds of people with splendid results. They came to him in droves and responded to his message with genuine fervor. This is quite amazing given that John was not exactly what anyone would call, consider, self-seeker friendly. Today, most churches want to enfold visitors, give them a warm greeting, but that wasn't John the Baptist's style. He had too much fire in his belly to bother with what might have deemed social pleasantries. When people came to him, John was not adverse to sneering. Well, well, well. Here you are all trying to see me, but do you know what you like to me? You look like to me? A bunch of slithering snakes fleeing a burning field. Who told you the fire was coming up behind you? What brings you here anyway? Probably not a few flo folks blanched and turned pale at such a greeting. Maybe some of them started to say something like this. Now, just hold on a moment, John. We're not pagans, you know. We are devout Jews, Abraham's children, heirs to the covenant. You can't talk that way to us. Save that for the Greeks. But before they could get very far, John cut them off. Hush up. I've had it up to here listening to the talk of Abraham's children. Abraham's children. God isn't interested in your family tree, but wants you to be a living tree of faith right now, producing spiritual fruit. If God wanted motionless, non-productive people, he could create them out of these rocks. You people are not living examples of, of faith, but more like marble statues, monuments to bygone people of faith, but dead as stone yourselves. Now you might think that this would be such a huge turnoff that folks should flee and head back home. But mostly that didn't happen. John was so fire, fire, sorry, John was so fiercely effective that before people even knew what they were doing, they blurted out, what should we do? John got through to them. He shook them up, not just untutored peasants, but also tax collectors well-to-do folks, and even strapping Roman soldiers. Think of that. John made armed men with shields and helmet quiver like scared children. In every case, when anyone asked John for advice on how to live better lives, John always came up with an answer. He encouraged generosity, honesty, fairness, he told tax collectors not to cook the books so as to line their own pockets. He told soldiers to stop shaking people down and coercing bribes. Basically, John told the people to be nice, to tell the truth, to share. Who knows what the people thought he was going to say? Perhaps they anticipated some heavy-duty admonitions to do spectacular ministry like opening in a leprosy clinic or establishing a release agency for victims of a famine. But no, John's advice was far simpler. Some years ago, many of us looked at the book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. It was a pretty simple little book, almost trite in one way, yet it sold well because it made a very good point. If we just find grown-up ways to live out our kindergarten virtues of kindness and sharing, the world would be a better place. So also with John the Baptist. The people expected John to give them a graduate school-like graduate school spiritual direction so they could all earn their PhDs. But instead, John took them back to kindergarten. John didn't promote spiritual PhDs, but spiritual ABCs. And it worked. 
John was on a roll. It's difficult to know just what was going through John's mind in his, as his ministry progressed. But if he felt good about the way God was using him, if his confidence level was rising steadily as time went by, you could hardly blame him. It's not that John was getting cocky, but he had hit on a formula that was working. So the day came when John dared to take on even Herod. Luke is sketchy as to how this came about, but clearly at some point John condemned Herod for his moral failings. Chief among them was marrying his sister-in-law. And it was precisely here that John's role came to an end. Now he had gone too far. This time, John criticized someone who was not going to be cut to the quick. This time he upset the wrong man, and so suddenly he found himself under arrest, locked in a prison where he would re remain for the end of his days. But the last verse of our passage this morning is not Herod's first appearance in Luke 3, is it? If you are a scripture reader at your church, then Luke 3, 1 is the kind of passage you hope never to get. For the second chapter in a row, Luke opened up with a litany of the then current political leaders. But at least with Luke 2, we have the advantage of having heard Quinarius pronounced in any number of Christmas Sunday school programs over the years. Luke 3 is far less familiar, throwing names like Tracon Traconitis and Licinius, among others. All in all, it's a pretty elaborate historical setup. But if at first it seemed unnecessary, by the time you hit verses 19 and 20, you realize that Luke included those political names for a reason. He wasn't merely fixing the date of John the Baptist's ministry. If I tell you that a certain event took place while Richard Nixon was president, then you know that whatever I'm talking about happened somewhere between 1969 and 1974. So also in Luke 3, once Luke mentions all those names from Tiberius Caesar on down, anyone familiar with the Roman history would know when John's ministry happened. But this nod, but this nod toward that era's political leaders was more than just a historical footnote. It is Luke's way of reminding us that the gospel is not an isolated phenomena that takes place off in some corner. The gospel is not a local reality, but is cosmic. Luke also quotes for us a few verses from Isaiah. But notice that this prophecy does not say that some valleys will be filled, filled in and just a few mountains will be made low. He doesn't, in the end, say a handful of people would see the salvation of God. No, he says every valley, every mountain, and all humanity will be involved. All the crooked roads would be made straight, and all the rough places would be smoothed out. So if someone said to John, don't concern yourself with Herod, he's too far away to bother you, you sense that John would have been furious. He was not called by God to put on a cute sideshow restricted to the banks of the Jordan River. John's job was to prepare, prepare the world for the Messiah event. All those high and mighty folks listed in verse 1 were involved, whether they knew it or not. They were going to come under the aegis of God. God's Christ, whether or not they liked it. On this second Sunday of Advent, here is a message that is bracing for us to consider. Because today, too, there is resistance to the idea that the gospel has global implications. 
Christmas has become a widespread phenomenon, of course, but it has long since been swamped by the more generic label of the holiday season. Talk to most any Jewish rabbi, and he will tell you that in their tradition, Hanukkah was always a very minor Jewish holiday, but it has swelled in importance in recent centuries only so that the Jewish children can have their fun and receive gifts over the holidays too. Now we also have Kwanzaa and perhaps even a couple of other traditions crowding in. Festivals and observance that tie not with Christmas per se, but the holidays more broadly. Across the spectrum of society, therefore, it's acceptable if we Christians want to zero in on Jesus. But we need to restrict the scope of our message. If it works for us, that's fine. But don't pretend that it had anything to do with anyone else. If we stay in our little corner, we can say, sing, and believe pretty much anything we want. But the moment we stray, the second we suggest that Jesus is the Lord of every person, every world, everywhere, the world turns on us. So long as John the Baptist restricted himself to teaching folks out in the middle of nowhere, he was safe. But John knew his message of repentance had to apply to everyone or else it applied to nobody. If the Christ whose way John was preparing could not speak to Herod's situation, then neither could Christ speak to any situation. We need to remember this too. But please don't think I am advocating some militant form of Christian faith that must sally forth into society violently to attack all those who do not share our faith. We cannot shove the gospel down people's throats. Nor should we despise the freedom of religious expression we have in this country just because some use that same freedom to express faith, faiths very different from our own. We should be thankful that we can celebrate as free and freely proclaim what we believe. What we must avoid, however, is concluding that our faith is finally only a private matter that has no bearing on those who do not believe. If and when we meet people who don't think much of Jesus, we must, we must not buy into the relativist, pluralistic notion that one religion or no religion is as good as the next, since it's all just a personal thing to begin with. This month, we must not let the generic holiday spirit dislodge that central Christian tenet that Jesus is the savior of the whole world. Christmas and the Christ Jesus at the center of it involves all people in all times and places, whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not. On the first Sunday in Advent, we noted that the church always begins Advent with an apoptolytic image in the popular imagination. Are the non Christmassy are, are as non Christmassy as can be Christmassy as be, can be imagined. Now today we encounter John the Baptist, whom the church has also long insisted is an absolutely necessary character in the Advent drama. But as we noted together some years ago, even most Christians don't want John at Christmas. We don't put John on Christmas cards. We have no John the Baptist tree ornaments. No child plays John in the Christmas programs. And he's nowhere to be seen in the front yard manger displays. John is too untidy, too dangerous for Christmas. Invite giant John to join your holiday party 
and he'll spell eggnog all over your Persian rug as he flails his arms talking about the need to repent. He's too shrill. If we let John in the door, he'll wake the baby in the manger. And then again, if we do not let John in, if we will not or cannot tolerate his uncompromising message that Christ is the Lord of all, then the baby in the manger may just as well go on sleeping forever and ever. Because if we can't let John in, we're not ready for the baby to wake up anyhow. If we don't like what John says, we won't like what the baby will eventually say either. And then Christmas is over before it really began. Amen. The song of response is Jesus, Light of the World. <laughs> 